Praise God. Happy New Year, everybody. I want to welcome all of our visitors here today. We welcome you for 2016 to Word Life Fellowship. Um, we, as you may have got the drift, we just finished a one-week-long fast. We didn't fast for a week, but for one week we were skipping meals and praying and seeking the Lord whenever we could come here when the weather wasn't prohibiting. And, and so today, um, at the end of this fast, we're breaking fast today after this service. So I want to invite everybody, all, your, all of our visitors, if, if you are here for your first time, we go over to our fellowship hall and we have a meal. And we have a meal prepared for you as well. And Nancy and Ron, where are you guys today? Show me your hands. Nancy and Ron, and who's the other couple with us today? And Jen and Gloria, okay, those people raise your hands and they'll meet you in the center in the back. Any visitors that would like to join us for a meal today, meet in the back after service and we will... We will go over there because today we've been fasting. People haven't eaten since yesterday. And so we're getting all excited to go and have a meal. So today start by opening your Bibles to Psalm 119. We're going to read the whole psalm. (laughs) And then I'm going to preach for an hour and a half. Then we're going to pray for everybody's deliverance starting on this side. No. We'll read Jesus wept, the shortest scripture, right? Now, today we are going to preach on pursuit. Psalms 23, 23 verse 6. It says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Then LT says, Surely goodness and unfailing love will pursue me because I made the Lord my shepherd. Goodness and mercy, unfailing love, will pursue me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 1 Timothy 6, verse 11 says, Timothy, O man of God, pursue a righteous life. A life of wonder, faith, love, steadiness, courtesy. Run hard and fast in this faith. Seize the eternal life, the life you were called to, the life you so fervently embraced in the presence of so many witnesses. Jeremiah 29, 11, in the New Living Translation, it says, For I know the plans that I have for you. These are plans, says the Lord, for good and not disaster. So many think disaster is what's on their horizon. But the Lord says, I have plans for good and not disaster. Plans for future and a hope and to give it to you. In these days, you will pray and I will listen. Now, did I just say that and nobody heard it? He said, you will pray I will listen. God's listening when you pray in the name of Jesus. If, there's that largest word in the Bible. If, if you will look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found of you, says the Lord, and I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. How many like that in 2016? Again, the title of my message today is Pursuit. So let's start by praying. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. For him shedding his blood for us. Taking our place on the cross. Dying so that we can have life. Thank you that you provided all of this so that we can have abundant life. Today, as we've gathered in your house, I ask that you will anoint ears and you'll anoint my mouth so that I will speak what you want spoken, we will hear what you want heard, we will walk out your life in the midst of this world. We pray this in the name of Jesus 
And everybody who agrees says, Amen. This year we've been challenged to pursue Him. To pursue His kingdom, His righteousness, to pursue His purposes, His purposes of rising up a glorious church, a church without spot or wrinkle, so that He is compatible with her and she's compatible with Him so that they can dwell and live together. This is what God is calling us to pursue. Shad kind of dove into it a little bit with his challenge. Good word, Shad. But let's do a little homework here. on What, what does the word pursue really mean? The American Heritage Dictionary says, to pursue means to follow in order to overtake. To follow in order to capture. It's not just a casual wandering around. Not that little puppy following your foot. This is something vehement. This is almost violent. This is, this is vigorous. This is used predominantly in the Old Testament in military terms. An army who has won the battle on the battlefield now pursuing the retreating army so that they can capture all. Pursuit is, is intense. And that's like that scripture in Psalm 23. It says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. No, I mean, you've got to envision this thing as almost like a carnivorous beast running up behind you and jumping on you. That goodness and mercy is going to capture you. Pursuit. It's to chase so you can catch. You're not just running for the sake of running. No offense to all those cross-country runners. Chase so you can catch. To strive to gain. To seek to attain to accomplish an end or a goal. In the Bible, the definitions are much the same. To follow hard after. It means to run after, to chase. That's the, that verse there, that word is, is uh, radaf in the Hebrew. You can find that in that scripture in Psalms 23, 6. Goodness and mercy shall follow, shall chase after, shall pursue you, chase you down until you are buried in goodness and mercy. Deuteronomy 6.20 in the Message Bible uses that same verb. It says, the right, the right. Pursue only what's right. Pursue. You pursue only what's right. It's the only way you can really live and possess the land that God your Father has given unto you. Proverbs 21.21 He who pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and honor. Another Old Testament word, there's like three or four that are translated pursue, translated chase, translated follow after. This one is dabak. There will be a test afterwards on your pronunciation of the Hebrew, right? Dabak. Nah, never mind. Okay. Dabak means, literally, this is interesting, to impinge, to cling or to adhere, figuratively to catch by pursuit. It means to follow hard after, to take, to overtake, to pursue hard. That's the verb that was used in Psalms 63.8, one, one of the verses that we've used as a sort of a theme verse throughout this week of fasting and prayer. My whole being follows hard after you, Lord, and clings to you closely. Your right hand upholds me. A third word in the Old Testament is bakash. Pretty quick, you're going to be fluent and, well, maybe not. Okay. It means to search, to strive after. It infers a great deal of energy and intensity as you strive to accomplish, strive to gain, strive to overcome and overtake. That's the one that's found in Jeremiah, verse 29, or chapter 29, verse 13. That if you seek him, you will be found of him. Not just a casual, huh, I didn't see him, I'm done but an energetic, almost a violent pursuit of God, then we will find Him. In the New Testament, pretty much just one word that's generally translated, unfortunately, seems kind of mild, but it's got that same intensity when you look into the original language, the word to seek. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness, right? I like the way the Amplified says it. The Amplified says, 
seek or aim at, like a gun or a bow and arrow, aim at and strive after first. That means before anything else. And what's in your mind when I think of anything? Anything, yeah. In the Greek, the word means anything, yeah. It's anything else comes second and third. We are to strive, aim at Jesus, God the Father, His kingdom, and His righteousness. And then it says, oh, I missed it. Seek first, strive after first of all His kingdom and His righteousness, His way of doing things, His way of being right. And then all these things taken together will be given to you. Besides, the Message Bible's got a real kind of interesting take on it. He says, steep your life. You're like taking a tea bag in boiling water. Steep your life in God reality. Let it soak in that God reality. Steep your life in God initiative. God initiating in your life. We're, we can pursue Him because He first pursued us. Seep, steep your life in God reality, in God initiative, and God's provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns and needs will be met. He didn't promise all our greeds, but He did promise all our needs. I found interesting also, God so loves it when His people pursue Him that He not only gives them what they are pursuing, but He adds things on top. Like, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You'll get the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Oh, and all this other stuff too. We read that scripture in Proverbs 21, 21, verse 21. Whoever pursues righteousness and unfailing love will find life, righteousness, and honor. So he adds stuff to it. Pursue. To follow in order to overtake and capture. Chase so you can catch. To run after violently, fervently, energetically. One of the things I noticed as I did this study, if we're going to pursue, really to pursue, intelligently pursuing, and listen, if you're taking notes, write this down. There must be an object of your pursuit. If you're going to pursue, there must be an object of your pursuit. No object, it's not really pursuit. You're just running in circles. You're just wandering around. A clear target must be found. A goal and a focus. Without such a goal, a focus point, without clearly knowing the object of my pursuit, my pursuit is nothing but rambling, wandering, scattered, distracted activity. Not really even pursuit. And I won't achieve my goal. If I do, it's just lucky. Because pursuit's about a goal and reaching it. So what are the, some of the things that prevent us from pursuing. The synonym, excuse me, the antonym of pursuit, the opposite, would be to give up. The opposite of pursuit is to quit, to be lazy, to retreat, to neglect, to be idle, simply just to not pursue. That's the opposite, right? A more common enemy of pursuit, a more common obstacle or detractor, particularly for Christians, is, is not so much the opposite, not so much quitting, but it's ignorance of the object of your pursuit. You just don't know what you're going after. I mean, for example, millions of Christians feel that Jesus Christ came to this earth so that they could go to heaven. That is clearly one of his causes, one of his reasons. It's a byproduct. Jesus came that we might have life, and life more abundantly, yes, when we're in heaven, but also here on earth. The Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The moment you receive Jesus, you're going to be going to heaven. But from that point in time, there is so much more. It's about the life of Jesus 
being in you and manifesting through you so that the world sees the life of Jesus through you. There's so much more. And this is a huge obstacle is that people aren't even aware of what their goals are. Their goals are to seek God, His kingdom, and His righteousness. Not in heaven. They don't have any shortage of God, kingdom, and righteousness in heaven. It's down here we need heaven. It's down here we need the light. It's down here we need the salt. We need you shining down here. So they fumble around in the dark, chasing other things and never achieve what God died to give them. It's one thing that they just miss it, but God, Jesus gave his whole life to give us the opportunity to do this. What a shame when people miss it. Another of the enemies and detractors from pursuit for many Christians, and I will say probably one of the largest obstacles for word of lifers. And it's not so much the opposite of pursuit. And it's not so much even ignorance or blindness. But distractions and non-focused activity. Distractions and non-focused activity. Not necessarily sin, but good things that keep us from great things. We get distracted by all sorts of stuff. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. So many of us, we put everything else before God, before His kingdom. I've got my job. I've got my hobby. i got my car. Don't mess with my car. I've got my shopping. Don't mess with my shopping. And definitely don't mess with my golf game. I've got my family. I don't see it say, seek ye first your family and then God in His kingdom. Bring your family into the kingdom and seek the kingdom together. And it won't be an either or. But what distracts us from great so often is what's good. It's not sin necessarily. It's just less than what God has called us to. Jesus and his disciples warned us at great length throughout the New Testament to not be caught up with the cares of this world. Yes, you have to have a job. Yes, you got to pay your bills. Yes, we have responsibilities. That is all part of God's plan. It's all part of the kingdom. We're supposed to bring the kingdom with us to work, to school, on the job, at the gym. But he gets first. And when he gets first, everything else will fall in place. Before I was a pastor, a lot of people say, well, that's easy for you to say. You're the pastor. You get to do the kingdom thing all day long. That You only work one day a week anyway, right? (laughs) But most of you who aren't visitors know that I worked for 32 years in manufacturing, the last 19 years of it as the associate pastor in pro bono position. So the kingdom of God is what we do at work, at the gym, on the street, in the grocery store. It's all about that. But we put him first. He's the best thing for your bottom line of your business. If you put him and his kingdom first. But we must know clearly the object of our pursuit. God, his kingdom, and righteousness. So I'm going to ask you a few questions and I don't want an answer. I want you to ponder it. I want you to answer the Lord. What's distracting you today? What are the distractions keeping you from focusing on the key object of your pursuit? What is hindering you from seeing and hearing His voice? Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, witnesses to the life of faith, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin. You notice weight and sin are not necessarily the same. That's the point. There's a whole bunch of good that we're doing that's keeping us from the great. And he's saying we've got to race 
We've got to race toward greatness. A race to achieve the greatness of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And there's some good stuff that we just don't have time for now. We've got to set this aside. Strip off the weight, every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. And we do this by keeping our eyes on our own stuff so nobody steals it. Keeping our eyes on our car so that nobody steals it. On our business so that nobody messes with it. Keeping our eyes on our family so that... No, we keep our eyes on Jesus, the champion and perfecter of our faith. You keep your eyes on Jesus, He'll keep His eyes on the rest of your stuff. You're not relinquished from the responsibility to pay your bills, love your family, no. But He gets first. He gets first. Last Monday I got a chance to talk to uh, Pastor Ted Uke. For the sake of visitors, he's a really good friend of ours. He's here pretty much every year now. I think he's going to try to get out here sometime in the spring also. Though I don't think he's preaching here. He's preaching to all our other church friends. Ted Uke's become a really good friend of mine, and, and I'm proud to say he's become a great friend, not only of this church, but of a lot of people in this church. And I'm t- I'll tell you, I'm proud of that. He calls people up and check on them, and I'm going, you keep it up, man. That's great. Because he's such a great guy. We talked last Thursday, and it was, I mean, last Monday. It was, okay, Ted, what's the word of the Lord for 2016? He says, well, I'm glad you asked. He says, pick up the pace. He says, pick up the pace. We need to accelerate the work and service. I don't think he's meaning that we have to make our services shorter. For him, personally, he ministers in Turkey, he ministers in Crimea, in Ukraine, and he just says, I'm seeing doors closing there. And so I'm making a point, I'm going to go as often as I can because I don't know how much longer I can go. But for the church, for the house of God, very similar to so many of the words that we heard, specifically, the Lord is calling His people to step up and to build to build on in a greater measure. That was a word spoken in prophecy just, just this last week. But he also shared something that I thought was really interesting. He preached last Sunday at the church he founded. He's no longer the pastor there, the senior pastor. But he preached out of 1 Samuel 30. This is a story of David the king. Well, he's not king yet. It's right before he becomes king. It's a story of the city that was outside of the, the, the borders of Israel. He was, he was a refugee outside of Israel. He had gone off to battle, and he come back, and his adversary had taken the city, burned it, and taken captive all the wives and children and flocks and and herds of of David and his army, his army of about 600 men. And they were just, to say the least, in great distraught and great depression to the point that the men literally spoke of stoning David. Mutiny was in the air. But but Ted said something to me. He goes, Pat, it, let's, it's going to be heartbreaking, obviously, if your family are now slaves, prisoners of, of another nation that's your enemy. But think of it allegorically, Pat. Their children and their families is their promise and their future. And their adversary had stolen their promises and their future. And in the depths of his depression, he encouraged himself in the Lord. He pursued the Lord. He inquired, sought the Lord, and God told him, get up, gather your army, and pursue the Amalekites, your adversaries, and you will overtake them, you will overcome them, and you will retain and restore all. Now, think about it also. This is a situation. His men are revolting against him. So now in his depression, he rises up and he's got to regain his leadership and take them because he can't do it by himself. He needs his partners. He needs his brothers. He needs the whole army to pursue and to take back and restore all that the enemy has taken from him. Anybody hearing me? 
I'm not talking about David right now. I'm talking about you and me and Word of Life Fellowship. Because for so many of us, an enemy has stolen your promise and your future. And he has separated you from your friends and the army you came to fight with. He said, it's over, it's done. But the Lord said, arise, be encouraged, and pursue all. Gather yourselves together with your brothers, with your sisters. Reconnect the army. You rise, you pursue, because it's a body message. It's a body ministry. And of course, the story ends with David doing exactly that. They regained everything. We received a word of prophecy just a few months ago, I think, even that long, that we're in a time of ziklag in this house, and that God is going to find this as a time for restoration if we will rise and pursue. This is our turn. This is our time. So let's get a little how-tos here. How are we doing on time? Okay. Got another hour to go. How do we pursue? How do we seek first the kingdom of God? You know, you get up and say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will He add unto you. For so many, it's just so much Christian blah, 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 blah. Yada, yada, yada. How? What? We know God provided everything we need for life and godliness. He has provided everything. He's already, you got a problem, He already solved it. He fixed it before it came. Jesus Christ, like Tony Miller says, He's the Lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. Before there was sin, there was a solution to sin. Before your problem came up, God already had a solution. What do we do? What's, what's our next move? I'm going to give you a few how-tos. This is a lifelong discussion. We're to Life Fellowship, starting with Pastor Tom Shaw, 47 years ago this May began the discussion of how do we walk in righteousness. It's been taught across this pulpit for these many decades, on Wednesday nights, on Sundays, at camp, at the Foundations class, crosswalk. There's so many opportunities to learn the how-tos. I got five minutes, maybe ten. So I'm going to tiptoe through and touch a few points. But I want to challenge you. This is our move. This year is our move, our time to rise and to pursue And if you want to know more detail, you want to know some more about what we're talking about, come talk to me. We'll plug you into some of these classes. Talk to Bob Wilk, the director of our school of ministry. We want God's people to rise and pursue. If we will, we'll obtain, we'll conquer, we'll restore all. So how do we do this? First of all, it can't be done on your strength. That means no matter how strong you are, you can't do it. That means no matter how weak you are, if you'll take a hold of the Spirit of the living God, you can overcome. You can rise and pursue. First of all, it has to be done, not on our strength, but on His strength. And it's according to His Word. It's not our idea. We're not going to do it our way. His way, His power, not our way and our juice. Number two, it can't be compartmentalized. Huh? It can't be compartmentalized. It says when you seek Him with at least half of your heart, you will find Him. I haven't found that. It's not even in First Patrick. When you seek Him with your whole heart, wholeheartedly, you will find Him. It's an all-in situation. It's got to be all in. It's all that I am. It's spirit, soul, and body. Sunrise, sundown, and all night long. We don't have a sacred life and a secular life. We don't live one life at church and another life at work or at school. It doesn't work. Oh, correction. People do that all the time. But they're not pursuing. And they're not going to overcome and they're not going to achieve what God's called for them. It just doesn't work. It's not designed to work that way. It's only designed when all cylinders are firing. We're all in, or it don't work. The first priority 
is a vertical relationship. How do we pursue? How do we pursue seeking God, His kingdom, and His righteousness? We start by developing a relationship, a vertical relationship between you and your Father in heaven. Through prayer and the reading of the Word on a regular basis. Regular basis isn't monthly. It's certainly not quarterly. It needs to be daily. How, how often do you need, or <clears throat> shall I say, how often do you want to eat? <laughs> Jesus told the devil, man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If you are serious about pursuing God, you've got to develop a prayer life and a study of the Bible life. That simple. Out it, it don't work. It's like taking oil out of your car. It's going to go just down the street and pull over, pitter-putter. First priority is a vertical relationship. It's not only the first step, but it's the foundation of all the rest of the steps. You don't need to do any of the rest of them if you don't, if you don't do that one. First is that relationship with God. It's really not so bad. He's a really cool guy. He really loves you. He's wealthy. And he wants you to be wealthy. All he says is, seek me, and you will find me, my righteousness and everything else you need. Number two, second priority, it's that horizontal relationship with one another. Is this starting to sound a little familiar? It's real. It's how we do this. Horizontal relationship with others. First with the house of God, and then with the community. We can't stop with just the house of God. We've got to reach out because the community, the world at large, needs you. You are to be the lights of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You are not to be a candle with a bushel over it. So we have to reach out to our community. But it's first to, our, to the house of God. Why? Because this is the armory. This is where the weapons are distributed. This, that's an allegory if you're <clears throat> not certain of that. And keep my reputation right here. Spiritual warfare, right? Okay. This is the power generation system. God designed the house of God. He designed the church of the living God to be the place where his weapons, his gifts, his tools are distributed through his people to the world. And it's also the place where his power flows. This is where you plug in. So many people want to go outside of the walls they're so intent on going outside of the walls that they tear the walls down in the process. And then they're out there and they've lost their source of replenishing. Or they've outrun their extension cord and they can't understand why their light went out. First the house of God, but then the community at large. So how do we seek the kingdom of God, seek His righteousness here in the house of faith? Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Consider one another. Consider one another. Just go over to fellowship sometime and watch how much consideration goes on. People cutting in line and coffee and hurrying up to get... Oh, watch today. Everybody's hurrying to get their food. In fact, back to Psalm 119. No. Consider one another. Whew. Man, we're talking rubber meat in the road here, consider one another in order to stir up. What are we supposed to stir up? I'm not asking what we stir up. I'm not looking for history. I'm looking for the future here. What are we supposed to stir up? Love and good works. And forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Some people say, hey, man, I don't need church. Church isn't important. That's just not scriptural. The Bible says we're not supposed to forsake the assembling. That means we're supposed to assemble together. Together. That's not, I assembled in my home and I watched Tony Miller on TV. It was great. We had a great church. That's not assembling together. That's not fellowshipping. That's not joint participation. That's not the design. It won't bring you success. You can do it if you want. You're, you're not going to be deprived access to heaven. You're just not going to fulfill what God's called you to do. It's that simple. 
Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, but things are getting tough, so do it less and less as the day approaches. If you look at some lives, that's what we're seeing. We're not going to look at history. We're looking at future. All the more as you see the day approaching, we're supposed to gather together. How do we, how do we seek the Lord? How do we pursue this? Showing love to brothers and sisters. In honor, preferring one another. Right, right down here in the nasty now and now. No more of the yada, 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 Christianese stuff. It's just loving our brother and our sister. Colossians 3. Forgive and make allowances for people's faults. Ouch! In fact, it says, he's talking to me, he says, Pat, you live holy and you forgive people their sins and you make allowances for their faults. I thought, I thought, no, no, he's got it backwards. You're supposed to live holy, and you're supposed to forgive me my sins, and you're supposed to make allowances for my faults. And that's how most of us treat the church. But we're supposed to come in here, and we're supposed to do our best to be holy. And we are supposed to intentionally forgive people's sins and intentionally make room, allowances for people's faults. In the community at large, at work, at school, at the gym, coaching a a sports team. What are we supposed to, how do we pursue righteousness? Work with biblical integrity. What? You mean I got to live the Bible? Honesty, diligence, not laziness, promptness, excellence, quality, consistency, steadfastness. These are, the th- these are the characteristics of Jesus that he placed within you when you were born again. He's not asking you to be somebody you're not. He's asking you to rise up and be who he's called you to be, who he designed you to be. Across the board, we're to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with our God. At school, at the at the grocery store. In short, we're supposed to love people regardless of whether they're lovable, regardless as to whether they're going to love us back because that's what Jesus did. And as Jesus is in the world, so are we now in the world. We're supposed to do things that in everyday life further the kingdom of God. Is that what we ask ourselves when we start to make decisions about our life, how we're going to act from everything, from what you're doing tonight, what you're doing tomorrow, work, vacation? How does it further the kingdom of God? It's about being a part of something bigger than yourself. If you're the biggest thing in your life, (laughs) hmm. Having someone else, Jesus, and having something, his kingdom, as the center of our life instead of us. That's the secret to seeking first the kingdom of God. Celine reminded me at Christmas time that joy is an acronym. J O Y. Jesus, others, then yourself. So I ask you today how are your decisions in 2015? in your actions? Were they advancing the kingdom of heaven? Were they pursuing God's kingdom and His righteousness? What are my goals this year? Remember, without a goal, we're not even pursuing. What are my goals this year? Are my goals God's goals for me? Or do I make up my own plan and put it before Him, ask Him to stamp His approval? What is in my life that keeps me from pursuing? What am I bowing down to? I think Jenny asked in one of her PowerPoints last week. What am I bowing down to? What controls me? Is it it our Father in heaven? Is it the Holy Spirit that controls us? 
What are our blinders that are blinding us? What are those ear coverings that are preventing us from being able to hear? What are the distractions? What are the good things we're doing that are keeping us from the great things? This is a fresh year. A new year, a fresh start. God's giving us an opportunity to close the door on 2015 and all that was there. He's giving us the opportunity to start again, to pursue Him, to pursue the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Our Father is rising up a glorious church. Whether we're involved with it or not doesn't stop it from happening. This is His plan. He's going to do it. In these last days, He's raising up an army. He's raising up a glorious church that's going to be without spot or wrinkle. Don't look at her today because she don't look like what she's going to look like soon. And you and I are being invited to be a part of that body of Christ. We simply have to rise up and pursue. Anybody here willing to rise up and pursue? Are we willing to let go of the good to go after the great? Are we willing to drop those sins that so easily trip us up and press in, press on, pursue until God finds us? Pursue Him until God finds us. Amen? Amen.